Okay, so welcome to my course, Computational Creativity. So this is uh, RPI Electrical Engineering ECSE 4964, 6964. Uh, and so my name is Rich Radke. Uh, so it's no exaggeration to say I've been working on this course all summer, waiting to bring it to you guys. So I'm excited to finally get underway after learning this stuff for a few months. Um, so you may have seen me in a course like Probability, uh, and sometimes I also teach image processing in the spring, uh, and I've usually been teaching this course on computer vision for visual effects in the kind of every few semesters, and this year I decided to swap that course out with this new course on uh, computational creativity. And so um, it's a computer vision and machine learning course, but it's definitely something that's more uh, interesting than what I've been, uh, you know, teaching in my normal image processing classes. So to motivate this, um, so my wife and I were at the supermarket and we saw this uh, cheese and this you know thing of cheap cheese, like a pint of cheese cost $23. And I was like, wow, it's hard for me to imagine like the sheep that produced this like super expensive cheese. And so I asked Dolly too to give me a representation of the sheep that might be making all this money off of this cheese, right? And so it made this beautiful, pretty photorealistic looking picture just from a description, right? That's something that 10 years ago seemed like science fiction, right? And now it's something that we almost take for granted, which is something that as a computer vision researcher is just totally crazy to me, right? Um, similarly, we're all familiar, oh, so let me just say that, you know, progress in this field has been extremely fast, right? So, um, you know, starting in around 2014, we could use algorithms that we're gonna talk about, you know, we're gonna start in this class from the very beginning, which is like 2014, basically. Uh, you could get these kind of fuzzy, weird, kind of sketchy looking human faces that were, were recognizably human, but nothing that you would recognize as photographic, right? And then as we moved into the 2020s, suddenly it became possible to make human faces that were virtually indistinguishable from the real thing, right? Um, with just a click of the button. Uh, and we'll talk about that for sure in this class. Uh, and now, not only can you make certain, you know, not only can you make faces or cars or cats or whatever from a certain class, but you can just describe in free text what it is you want to create. And Dali or Midjourney or Stable Diffusion will spit out a, you know, pretty beautiful looking picture, right? Could be a photograph, could be an illustration, could be a diagram. It's really impressive what these algorithms can do. Having really only taken off in, in a way in the past like 10 or 15 years, right? Um, and so kind of that's what we're gonna do in this class, at least on the image side, is gonna go from the evolution of these kinds of blurry, crummy looking images to today's, you know, very photorealistic images. Um, in a similar way, all of you I'm sure are familiar with ChatGPT, right? And similar text generation methods, right? So here I asked ChatGPT to tell me a gritty crime story involving a superhero sheep. And it just like, thought for half a second and started spitting out this perfectly realistic, perfectly coherent text, right? Um, again, something that, you know, when I was in grad school, there were chatbots and stuff like that, that would be able to produce like kind of, you know, reasonable conversations, like kind of mimicking what a human might do. But ChatGPT is like, you know, orders of magnitude more impressive and more complicated than that, right? Um, and so, uh, that's really impressive and crazy. But then at the same time, you know, I asked it to tell me about myself. Tell me about Rich Radke. First it says, I don't know anyone named Rich Radke. And then I said, he's from RPI. And suddenly ChatGPT had a lot to say. So it said that there are three Rich Radkeys, right? There is a professor of ECSE who's uh, been here since 1998, which is not really true. I've been here since 2001. Um, the rest of it is pretty accurate. And then there's the other two Rich Radkeys, um, one of whom apparently founded Infinity Games and made a baseball video game that was super popular. And the other one who's a former president of the RPI Alumni Association. So I was like, I never heard of these Rich Radkeys, so let's tell me more about them. And here's some more information about them. You know, all seems pretty reasonable, right? Uh, except that actually, you know, uh, there was no Rich Radke that was the founder of Infinity Games. Infinity Games didn't make this baseball superstars game. No one named Rich Radke was named to be 30 under 30 at this uh, category or was on the RPI Founders Council. And certainly there was no famous Rich Radke that was uh, on the alumni board or the chair of the board of trustees, I certainly would have heard about that, right? So I said, well, I don't think those two people actually exist. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, if they probably don't exist. It was my mistake, right? So ChatGPT is all great until you start to actually press the limits of whether it is factual, right? It's amazing at doing this kind of next word logical text prediction, but it's not the kind of thing that you should trust for anything that has, you know, real societal, real world importance, right? You know, no matter how good the code that it generates or the essays that it makes, you always have to look and see whether this is actually meaningful text, right? So we're also gonna talk about how do these kinds of generative models work? 
Um, so there is so much hype about this type of um, research, right? So here we are. This is something called the hype curve, the, um, the hype cycle, rather, right? So there are various technologies that have been, you know, uh, that are just at the beginning of like, this seems like this could be interesting, right? And then we reach where we are now with generative AI, the peak of inflated expectations, right? Which is where you're seeing a news article you know, or more every day about something or other involving these generative AI techniques. And eventually there's this fall off where actually it turns out that things are maybe not as great as we thought. And we get into the trough of disillusionment and followed by eventually a plateau where we actually see that these tools are useful, right? So in some sense, you know, here's kind of my research Jerry over here is computer vision, right? So computer vision, according to this diagram, is kind of off in the world of now we really understand what computer vision is good for, what it's not good for, what it can do, what it will never be able to do. Uh, but generative AI is still in the kind of super hype uh, area of the curve, right? And in some sense, that's kind of why I wanted to talk about it, because this is a research topic that impinges on, you know, kind of academic research, but also on kind of how are people in society talking about it? It's crazy, the, as, as we're going to do in this course, it's crazy to me to see people talking about all these knobs in the stable diffusion interface, for example, as if they confidently know like what they do or what they mean, whereas they come out of research papers that they can't possibly understand without like reading them, right? It's just like, oh, just you know, download this LoRa and it will do this thing. It's like they don't know what low rank approximation really is or anything like that. So it's, it's something that has now become in the hands of people uh, to, to really play with. One thing I will say is that, you know, I could have called this course generative AI, right? Because that's really kind of what this course is. But I have an instinctual dislike of that term, partially because um, to me, AI is such a buzzwordy, vague, can mean anything that you want kind of term. So I didn't want to really call myself an AI researcher to talk about doing an AI course, right? Generative, as we're going to talk about in a second, does have a explicit meaning in machine learning, and that's that's okay. Um, this is a quote from a sci-fi author, Ted Chang, who's, who's really great. And he said, basically, you know, what is artificial intelligence? It was a poor choice of words in 1954, right? Where a bunch of, you know, kind of people got together to define a thought experiment about what artificial intelligence is and means. And now we've been stuck with this term for 60 years of people who are just using it however they want, right? I think there are a lot of things that are not AI that people are calling, I mean, I don't even want to get into it, right? So that's why I call this course computational creativity, right? My interest is in, um, you know, how do people use these tools to create fun looking images, interesting looking text, and generally aid human creativity, right? How are artists using it? How are, you know, lawyers using it? Basically, things that are pretty relevant to our real world, right? Um, I'm not looking to kind of say that the images that are created are art or anything like that. I want to know how are people using these tools to kind of supplement or complement human abilities, right? And so I have a vision for this course, and we'll see how it actually goes. Actually, let me just adjust my OBS for just a second, because I see there's like a little cutoff here. Uh, OK, better. So. Um, so I hope this course will be fun, first and foremost, right? So, um, you know, this stuff is inevitably, it's, it's fun to make images, it's fun to make ChatGPT chat stay stuff, right? So I kind of want to, you know, not just have a super dry technical course, right? Uh, I want to make it very up to date. So uh, a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about and discussing is really from the relatively modern era. So even the stuff that is considered kind of classical in generative AI is like from like the mid 2010s, right? So it's not actually that old for the most part. Uh, but then we're gonna be talking about a bunch of papers that come out in 2023 and 2022, you know, stuff that is just hot off the presses, right? Uh, in a way, you don't even have to publish a paper anymore to be able to make a contribution to this area because uh, people just put up stuff on archive and download, put some source code on GitHub and people start to play with it. And even before it's kind of vetted by any sort of scientific community, it's already out there, right, being used. Uh, I want to be hands-on and so, in some sense, what that means is I don't want you to be using um, canned, you know, data sets. I don't want you to be kind of just like, I mean, obviously you'll be munging a lot of code bases together to make stuff work, but I want you to have an element of, you know, I want to try to make images of these things that didn't exist before, right? I'm going to go out and take pictures and try to make a generative model that makes these pictures, right? Um, so I want it to be something where you take some agency and some ownership of what you create, right? Not just using a whole bunch of data sets and using benchmark, you know, things to click a button and run and see how it does, right? I have a, a broad view of what I want to do, right? So I want to cover 
a lot of material, and we'll talk about that uh, when we talk about the syllabus in just a second. But you know, I, I want to talk about quite a bit of stuff, which means that I may not be able to go into the level of detail that you need to implement this from scratch, right? So uh, we'll have a few lectures on VAEs and a few lectures on GANs. And so certainly I will talk about this stuff in a, in a high level of technical detail, but at the same time, I also want to talk about, you know, how do we make images? How do we make text? How do we make music? How do we make PowerPoints automatically? I've got a lot of stuff I want to cover, and so that means that I'm going to be dipping my toe into lots of different places. Um, for those of you that are super technically minded, so I know there are a lot of grad students in this class, this may seem a little hand wavy to you, right? There may be a point where like, well, how do you actually do that? And I'm not going to tell you the answer, right? So that's where for the graduate level of the course, you have to do a little bit of work on your own. If you're really interested in some things, you may have to go and read the paper, right? As opposed to relying on my lecture to tell you every element of how something works. And finally, the class is going to be somewhat subjective in the sense that um, I, first of all, there's no TA in the class, right? So all the assignments are going to be graded by me, which means that you'll be up against my judgment about what makes a good picture or what makes a good assignment, right? So given that we're making images and text and so on, right, um, you know, the assessment that you get will be less on, you know, does this code compile and run or did you get the answer, you know, of this eigenvalue problem than it is about, like, did you put a lot of effort towards the assignment and make images that look good and show me that you understand what's going on, went a little bit beyond the assignment. So that's going to be in my subjective hands, right? So for those of you that are more used to a course where there's lots of like, you know, auto gradable assignments by submittee or something like that, this is not that course, right? Everything that you, that you submit is going to be graded by me. Um, like I said, I'm very interested in like, how are people using this stuff, right? So one of the reasons the course is called computational creativity is that people, you know, like, influencers and YouTubers and artists are just kind of like grabbing code bases and making these kind of creative and artistic outputs, right? I want to talk about that aspect of things, right? It's not all about the dry technology of how something works. It's about, okay, well, you know, now that you've got it working, what can you do with it, right? So uh, I follow a bunch of people on Instagram that use this stuff. So this uh, influencer, Karen X Cheng, is really cool, and she makes these just little 30 second reels that, that show her use of stable diffusion or you know, mid-journey outpainting and all this stuff that again, you don't have to be a computer vision or a machine learning expert to be able to get your hands dirty with making stuff that looks cool. Um, you guys may have seen there was a anime rock, paper, scissors from this group called Corridor Digital that makes all these cool visual effects videos. Um, so they made this whole anime rendered version of a scene that they shot in their studio from green screen and made it look like an anime movie. And again, this is all stuff that's just totally publicly available uh, and it's, you know, anyone could do it. And then I want to talk a little bit about more of the fine art side, right? So this right-hand picture is by an artist named Sophia Crespo who uses these generative adversarial networks or GANs to make these kinds of dreamy, naturalistic, but not exactly photorealistic images of, you know, birds and jellyfish and parrots and stuff like that. So we will talk a little bit about how our artists use this material to you know make their art right uh, and then we'll talk a little about the downsides of things right so uh, for example here's a chart showing that the amount of uh, tons of carbon dioxide that it took to train chat GPT-3 on the top bar is about 500 times uh, one passenger's air travel from New York to San Francisco. And it's about 100 times the amount of carbon dioxide that you expend being a human in a year, right? So is that a good trade-off, right? Um, you know, the energy usage that it takes to do these things, the power, you know, where is that energy coming from? We'll talk some about these ethical types of issues involving the training of these huge foundation generative models, right? Um, so what is this course not, right? So despite this lecture, this is probably the unique lecture, it's not gonna be a lecture of PowerPoint slides, right? It would be so easy to just smack up a bunch of diagrams like this and just click through them, right? And this is what you're gonna see in a course on like deep learning, right? But to me, this is like extremely deeply boring. Like I don't think that, that there's any way that you as a student live in the classroom could look at a picture like this and really get anything out of it, right? Um, you know, to me, to be honest, deep learning is just like a zillion knobs that no one has any idea how to control that produce magical results, right? So for me, I'm not, I mean, obviously we can't talk about this material without talking about deep learning. It is just inherent to the, to the ability of these tools to work. But at the same time, it's not gonna be a course that overlaps hopefully too much with like the actual deep learning course that we have where you learn all about what these diagrams and knobs actually do, right? So I will talk a little bit about the deep learning that you have to know, but at the same time, it's not 
to be thought of as a like hardcore deep learning class. That's not what I want to get out of this class. Um, it's also not a class where you demonstrate your programming ability to me. Even though there will be a lot of programming in it, you know, I'm going to be very uh, hands off about how you accomplish the things that I ask you to do on the assignments, right? Which means that you're going to need to be fairly self-directed in terms of getting stuff done, which means I don't care whether you use PyTorch or TensorFlow or whatever, right? You can download stuff from, you know, you could use Collab online, you can use Docker and, you know, Conda repositories, whatever you find to, to plug stuff together to make it work is fine with me. But again, I'm no programming expert either, right? So uh, that's going to be a question mark as we go through the course. Since I've never taught it before, we're going to have to find a level that says, okay, this is stuff that I can reasonably ask you to do that, you know, I don't expect that everyone in this class has a mega supercomputer, you know, or even like a super high power desktop, right? So the question is, what are you going to be able to accomplish in this class using, you know, either the computers that you have, you know, uh, web-based stuff like Collab Notebooks, or, you know, we could figure out how to use the RPI aim of supercomputer, right, to do certain things, right? There may be some possibilities there. But again, the, the focus is not on programming. Fundamental engine, the focus is on concepts, right? What kinds of tools are used to do all these various things? So it's not going to be something where I'm teaching you everything from zero, right? Uh, it's going to be something where you're going to bring in a lot with you. You're going to be figuring out a lot of stuff along the way. So I wouldn't consider these lectures themselves to be entirely self-contained because they're not, right? I will try to make everything, you know, I won't, I won't try to wave my hands too much, but there are some things that inevitably are not going to be included in my verbal lectures here. And I need you to be involved, right? So, uh, you know, I don't want to have like a sea of faces that are just staring back at me like you're watching a YouTube video, right? I need people who are going to kind of like jump in with both hands and actually figure stuff out and talk on the Discord about how they figured to make stuff. So I want there to be a good sense of participation. And part of the, part of the course grade is my sense of how kind of engaged you are, right? So that's something else that may be a little bit different than your normal class. Okay, so um, how do I want to start this off? First, let's a little bit talk about um, generative models, period, right? So uh, what is a generative model? Since the, you know, generative AI is the big thing, um, this course, or this uh, lecture is basically titled Intro to Generative Models. And while I'm writing this down, let me say also that I am by nature a pen and paper lecturer, right? And this goes back to not wanting it to be a PowerPoint slideshow, right? I could get through a ton more material if I just click through PowerPoint slides, because there are lots of equations and so on in this course. But at the same time, I uh, feel like me writing stuff down is kind of like a gating mechanism, right? It helps me go slower, because I'm a fast talker, as you can tell, right? In theory, I think that everything that I write down and say, you should be able to take notes on, right? So I think it's good to take notes to remind yourself of what I was saying, right? I will take these uh, documents and put them online, um, at least for the RPI students. I'm, I'm recording this for the YouTube posterity, so for those of you that are watching on YouTube, not in the classroom, not everything you see here is going to be available, because there is going to be some some stuff that makes being an RPI student uh, useful, right? Um, but yes, like I said, I'll be drawing mostly stuff here, and I will only resort to PowerPoint stuff when I want to show an image of some sort, like what is the result of this algorithm, right? I'm not going to draw it out like DaVinci here. OK, so if you've taken a machine learning course before, and I'm going to talk a little bit about like, the syllabus in just a second, uh, probably the focus of a course like that was on what was called discriminative learning. So uh, discriminative learning. Discriminate, I'm already spelling it wrong, discriminative learning. Right? Discriminative learning is basically, I want to be able to classify an object, right? So for example, what I may do is I may take a bunch of pictures of cats and dogs, or maybe since this is a, you know, sheep motivated class, you should be like sheep and goats. And what I do is I show it a bunch of pictures. And I call each of these things an observation. And each of these things a label. And then I kind of give a score, say I want to call cats ones and dogs zeros, right? I put this into a model that I train. So this process is called training. And then what comes out is a prediction. So if I put a new picture in here, and I apply it to my trained model, and I ask it to predict something, it will give me a score, right? 
And this score is basically a fraction that's basically on a scale of 0 to 1. How likely is this to be a cat, right? So that's an example of a kind of a continuous value discrimination. Or I could just have it be something where I predict you know, a label, right? Cat, dog, whatever, right? And so uh, maybe I have a list of categories that I'm predicting one of these X categories. And so computer vision and machine learning have become amazing at these kinds of discriminative machine learning problems over the years, right? Um, however, just because you have a classifier that can do an, ex an amazing job of recognizing cats doesn't mean that you've gotten any closer to understanding how to make a cat picture yourself, right? That's the difference between discriminative and generative, right? So a generative model is basically that problem, right? So a generative model is basically, I start out with a bunch of observations. Let's say these are training pictures of cats. So my training data. I undergo my training process. Now I have a model. And now what I do is I sample from that model, right? We're going to talk about what sampling means in just a second. But basically, I do a random sample. And what I get is a picture, an image. So I don't get a number. I don't get a classifier label. I get a picture. You know, these generated images should look like cats if I did a good job. And so a probability way of thinking about this is what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to learn the probability distribution of cat pictures in image space, right? So we're trying to learn the distribution of training data P of x. And the reason that we learned it is so we can sample from it, right? So then I can, so we can sample from it. So we're trying to basically say, okay, now if I sample from this distribution that I've learned, what I get should be something that is consistent with, should look like the training data, right? And it should be probabilistic, right? In the sense that, you know, I can't always, you know, one extremely dumb way would be for the model to say, okay, just repeat training data sample one, right? Well, that would look great. It would look like a cat picture, but we, there would be no sort of variability, right? So an important feature of a generative model is that when I do my random sample, I can get lots of different random images every time that are consistent with the model, right? So there has to be this notion of probability in it, right? And so this problem is much harder than a discriminative problem, right? So you know, these images of cats that I want to create may have, you know, millions or tens of millions of pixels in them, right? How do I possibly describe that much information, right? Or how do I even, like, begin to describe text, right? How does ChatGPT understand how the next word should follow from the previous paragraph? Like, how does it even describe words? So we're going to talk about all that stuff. The key idea is that we are going to extract some sort of features from these inputs that make it easier to work with, okay? And so we're going to try to basically move the input into some lower dimensional space that kind of represents the observation, okay? And so for a long time, when people talked about machine learning, they were kind of really thinking about discriminative learning. Um, and the reason is that discriminative learning is easier, right? So if I'm thinking about this, the discriminative learning problem is really saying, you know, the probability of a label given an observation. I'm trying to get a good model for that. And that's a much easier problem. Also, to be honest, discriminative learning has a lot more real world applicability, right? So like, I would like to put a CAT scan into my machine learning algorithm and get a probability the patient has a certain kind of disease. Or I would like to, you know, uh, 
put my you know, video into a machine learning bottle and get bounding boxes that correspond to where bags are on the conveyor belt in an airport, right? Those are kinds of problems that have like immediate kind of clear real world applicability. And to be honest, you know, this kind of idea of machine creativity seemed like, again, science fiction and also not super immediately relevant. And if I'm being honest, I think that, you know, people are still trying to find like the good you know, use cases for these generative models. They are cool, but I'm not exactly sure I'm buying the argument that they're changing the world yet. So the ability to even do this generative modeling really took effect probably, you know, when a bunch of things converged, right? So first of all, uh, GPUs became super powerful and commodity GPUs became popular or possible to buy for the average person or well-funded academic laboratory. Uh, huge amounts of trained data in the form of computer vision annotated data sets were out there in the mid 2010s. And then also uh, deep learning algorithms suddenly became very popular and easy to use in that era as well. So it all kind of converged to make this kind of tipping point occur where now it seems like everyone is talking about just generative modeling instead of really interested in discriminative modeling, right? So um, let me kind of be a little more, uh, you know, illustrative about like, here's an example of a generative model, okay? So where's my example? So let's suppose that I show you, you know, these points, right? And I ask you to build a generative model for the distribution that generated these points, right? And so again, one of our kind of guidelines for what a generative model should be is it should be kind of relatively simple, right? So a super simple way of describing these points might be just to say, I'm going to draw the bounding box around these points. And to generate a new point, I'm just going to uh, pick a point from within this rectangle, right? That is a super easy generative model, right? Um, so these are all training samples. And now this is my kind of guess for, you know, what generated those points. Probably not a great guess, um, but, uh, you know, it is a generative model, right? So as I said, this is probably not a great generative model. So if I put the actual points uh, on top of this world map, you can see that my data generating distribution is actually just like uniformly distributed across the land mass of the world, right? And these are the points I happen to sample from that. Now my generative model you can see is probably not that great, right? So certainly I can sample some points, right? Like this point that I sample from the rectangle is perfectly fine, right? Uh, this point that I sample from the rectangle is not good, right? Because I can't generate this point. Uh, well, this is not part of the actual model distribution, right? This is something that I can create with my model that uh, doesn't work, right? Or there are also points that are out of distribution, right? So for example, this green point at the top would be fine for the model distribution, but is bad for my generative model, right? So the name of the game is to try to build as good a general model as possible that kind of has all the good stuff, but none of the bad stuff, and also isn't super complicated, right? So I mean, a super complicated way of describing this would be to kind of like have a centimeter level topographic map of the world, right? And that would be this like very complicated way of describing how to generate the model, right? There may be better ways to do it. And so uh, that's kind of like, again, where we're going to be going throughout the class. Um, so Again, that's kind of like the watchword is the model should be easy to sample from and not overly complicated, right? Um, so a, a key insight here is we want to find a space in which to describe what's going on that is boiling down the essence of what characterizes the observations, right? And so this is sometimes also called representation learning. And also the key phrase that we're going to talk about is called the latent space, OK? And so to kind of motivate that, let me give you another example here. So let's suppose that instead of these points here, I gave you a bunch of pictures of uh, cylinders, right? And so instead of imagining that these are you know, kind of just like black and white cylinders that I've drawn on the page, you know, let's suppose that I just saw a whole bunch of examples, right? So these could be, for example, let's imagine that these are like nicely rendered uh, 1024 dimensional images. With lighting and all that stuff, right? So not just like stick cylinders, right? But as a human, you immediately recognize that there's really only two degrees of variation in this data, right? The height of the cylinder and the width of the cylinder, right? So there's really only two degrees of 
you know, what I would call variation. So what I could do is I could imagine that I take an image of a cylinder coming in, which is 1024 by 1024. And then I make what's called an encoder. And that is the height and the width of the cylinder. And then I make a decoder that basically gives me back an image. And so this two-dimensional space is what we call the latent space, right? I've taken a million numbers and turned them into two numbers that do an excellent job of representing what was going on in the image, right? And in some sense, you could argue that, um, you know, this problem is a computer vision problem, right? How can I look at an image and tell what's going on? And this problem is basically like a computer graphics problem. How can I tell you the dimensions of the cylinder and make a beautifully rendered image that corresponds to um, what's going on. So here you have computer vision, computer graphics, and machine learning all in one nice package, right? Um, and so the nice thing is that once we have this latent space, I can sample from it and create examples that were never seen in my original training data, right? So for example, you know, I never saw a short and skinny cylinder like this, but once I've got this idea of the latent space that's good, I can generate that with my generative model, right? Um, and so we are kind of generalizing from the data. That's also a very important concept is not just be able to exactly reproduce the data, but to be able to create new things that look like they could have come from the data distribution that I never saw examples of before, right? And to be honest, that's how all of this kind of like, you know, dolly type image generation has to be working, right? Because clearly there's never been a picture of, you know, a sheep wearing gold chains that it can go out and gather from the internet, right? I made it make that picture, you know, from sampling from what those kind of images might look like, okay? All right, so this is maybe a good time to talk about, um, well, let's, let's talk about topics for a second, right? Well, no, let's talk about syllabus. So I handed out syllabi, um, and so the uh, syllabus is on box. And so again, this is if you're an RPI person, you should be able to find the uh, course website, which is, oh, so first of all, the course website is uh, on GitHub, right? So I'm trying probably too many new things this semester, right? So I am uh, putting the course website on GitHub instead of on Piazza. Uh, I'm using Discord for discussion instead of you know Piazza and stuff like that. So we'll see how all these new tools happening at once are gonna work, right? But I like the way these GitHub pages look. So, um, so here is our main course website, and this is where all the information that you need is gonna be, right? Um, if you look at resources, uh, hopefully this link will still work, right? So if you go to RPI box, you have to do your good old duo push. Once you're pushed in, you should be able to make it work. Luckily, I'm already bring my phone. Oh no, I'm already logged in. Ah. Okay, so um, this course is offered at the undergraduate 4964 and graduate level 6964. Up to you which one you choose to take. I mean, depending on your graduate program, you know, even if you're a graduate student, you can take the 4,000 level version if you want. And if you're an undergraduate, you can take the 6,000 level version if you get permission from, I guess, me. Um, so we'll talk about what the differences are in just a second. Um, so everything that is on this GitHub, rep, the course website, you're responsible for watching, right? That's where I'm gonna put all the information. Uh, you know, anything that's really important is gonna be on that website. So make sure you bookmark that. And then um, I'm not gonna use RPI LMS, I haven't used that for years. Uh, I'm gonna use Gradescope for collecting and grading work. And so all that stuff is already linked to the, um, you know, it's already linked to the website, um, you know, in terms of like, if you look at the top, there's a Gradescope thing and also a box. So we're gonna be using uh, RPI's box folder for when you generate images or generate, you know, data that's too big to upload to Gradescope, you'll put it in a, a folder on box. And also this media site link is for the videos. I'm gonna put those up archivally on media site, but I'm also gonna be putting them on my YouTube channel. So either way should work. Um, but uh, for RPI students, these, the, these links will work for you, but not for anybody else. Okay, and so I have a pretty good plan for what we're gonna do. Uh, you can kind of scroll down to see the stuff we're gonna be talking about. Uh, up until the end of class, I'm pretty, I'm pretty well done up until November 9th. So I gotta write these lectures, but the rest of it I've already got done. So it should be good. Um, let's go back to the syllabus for a second. Okay, so 
prerequisites, which I'm sure are people on people's minds, right? So what are the prerequisites for this course? So what I said on uh, you know SIS and so on was a first course in machine learning, okay? And I'm not going to be picky about exactly what that course was, right? Could be an R department, could be the machine learning from data course in comp sci, you know, could be you know maybe intro to AI in comp sci. Basically, I'm going to be using a lot of terminology that. I kind of expect people to have like base level familiarity with, right? And so um, I will try to teach, you know, key stuff as we go. But I feel like just because this is a senior level graduate level course for kind of like the maturity that I want is someone who's not coming in and has never seen any sort of machine learning before, right? If you've never done any machine learning, this is probably not the course for you, right? It's possible, but it's probably not the right course because it's going to be a lot of technical material that I'm going to assume that you know. Not, and, and in some sense, having machine learning as a prerequisite also implies that you already know things like probability, right? So ECSE 2500, engineering probability, we're definitely going to be talking about PDFs and so on. Um, you know, calculus, uh, programming are also kind of implied in the, this level of course, right? So I didn't put those as explicit prerequisites, but, you know, if you've taken any machine learning course, you should be already more or less on the road, right? Um, and also, like I said, important to me is also like a mindset of wanting to be engaged in the class, right? So not just sitting here expecting it to be a one-way fire hose of information, but I want people who seem like they're kind of like some light in the windows coming back at me when I'm talking, right? Um, okay, so like I said, I'm using Discord for the um, uh, discussion, and so please join the Discord. That's like assignment number zero. There's nothing in the Discord yet that's of any interest, but this is a good place to find uh, you know, team members. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, to ask for questions about how do I do certain things, uh, to share interesting results or errors that you got, to generally put goofy you know, AI memes in the chat. Uh, you know. So basically, um, you know, I want this to be the key place where we kind of cluster. Um, you know, Personally, I use Discord all the time, so I, I figured this was easy for me. Hopefully, Discord is not totally unfamiliar to you. If it's not something you use it for, it's also super easy. So don't stress out over it. It's, it's very easy to join and see if there's anything going on. Um, so that's, that's the way I want to do uh, the class discussion in place of you know, what used to be Piazza. Um, I will occasionally be sending you out things on Google Forms. On you know, We don't have a WebEx team for the class. But we may use WebEx in case we have a guest speaker. I'll talk about it in a second. Uh, the usual stuff. Um, and so I believe that this morning I added everyone who has registered into the class as of around noon. I put you on Gradescope and I put you as a, as a viewer uploader on the box folder. But I see a bunch of people. Like there, there are more people here than are registered for the class, and so that's great. Uh, if you're shopping around for the class, that's excellent. Um, but let me know your RCS ID. Just email it to me, and I will add you to both of the Discord and the Gradescope. Um, OK, so this is me. My current thinking is to have office hours on Tuesday afternoons. We have class on Monday, Thursday afternoons. Um, so textbook. So I really like this, uh, this textbook, Generative Deep Learning by Foster. Right. So this, this is a second edition, but literally came out in June. So it's got like Dolly 2 and Stable Diffusion and ChatGPT and all this stuff in it. Right. So I was very happy to find one book that seemed to have almost everything that I wanted to teach in it. Of course, we're going to be going beyond this book too, right? So I'm going to be going from this book into research papers that you know are not you know available at the time of printing. But I think if you're looking for one good resource, this is the one. And also, I really like the way this author explains uh, ideas, right? These examples with the map and the cylinders I showed you at the beginning of class, these are from the Foster book, right? And I think that generally the way that the author motivates these really super complicated concepts is very well done, right? So this is at the bookstore, and I would suggest that you pick it up. I think you can also get the PDF if you want. Um, and also, there are going to be papers from the literature that we're going to be putting online. And so if you look to see, not all of these are um, available yet, but you know, if, if you click on every lecture, you'll see other readings that are related to what we're going to be talking about in class, right? So I'll put the corresponding section of the book if it exists. And otherwise, there are some readings that relate to what I talked about. Um, you know, I don't think necessarily that you need to read these readings in depth uh, before class or anything like that. But the reason I'm putting them there is because they're extremely related to what I'm talking about, right? So I definitely recommend looking at that stuff. Um, in terms of course content, right? So I guess I can switch back to my uh, PowerPoint for a second. So course content, um, first we're going to do next week just a very quick uh, you know, review of the math that you need. So these, these are great machine learning comics that I found from an artist named Mia Tang. So you can look her up on uh, her website and on Instagram. So we'll talk a little about you know, 
like next Monday is what you need to know, or next Tuesday is what you need to know math wise. And then we'll talk a little bit about, you know, just like a crash course in deep learning, right? We can't avoid talking about deep learning. And so I'm going to give you like the 80 minute overview of everything important about deep learning for this class, right? So if you haven't had deep learning class, that's where we'll talk about some of the key ideas, right? Then we're going to go into what are called variational autoencoders, right? So VAEs were kind of like the first uh, you know, that's what was responsible for these kind of blurry, not so good images of faces, but still that was like the beginning of the field, right? So we're spending a couple lectures on variational encoders, which helps us kind of get this idea of the latent space down, right? And this is exactly the kind of thing I was trying to illustrate before, right? We have a picture, we go into some lower dimensional space, and then we reconstruct that picture and it looks like the original, right? So GANs, you probably have heard of also, generative adversarial networks. So GANs was another like big step forward for the whole field in terms of making much more realistic images, right? And the kind of key idea is that you're simultaneously training two networks, one that is making good pictures and one that is trying its hardest to discriminate the good pictures from the bad pictures, right? And so by kind of making these these models compete for each other, you get basically an extremely good image generator. And that's the idea behind a GAN. So we'll talk about that uh, for sure. And then diffusion models, right? So this is what is behind things like stable diffusion and Dolly and Midjourney and so on, right? This is what everyone's using now to create these you know, generated images. Uh, and again, it seems like magic. Basically, the premise is that you take an image that's totally noise and you kind of unnoise it until you get a beautiful clear image, right? It seems like it shouldn't even be possible, but that's the way that it works, right? So we'll talk about how that works. Um, and then we'll talk a little about like attention and transformers, right? So you probably maybe, well, you may have heard of the word transformer, right? So transformer is like, again, the thing that everyone is using, using now in computer vision and, and language modeling and so on. So we'll spend a few lectures talking about attention, transformers, how that relates to language models and so on. Uh, and then kind of how it all comes together to do things like DALL-E 2, where you have a text prompt that somehow turns into an image, right? So that's kind of like, the key core material. And then we'll talk about, um, if I go back to the um, syllabus, you can see that we're also going to go back to, um, you know, this kind of what I just talked about gets us through to here. Then I want to talk about things like, you know, how do we generate uh, 3D models from text? How do we generate music and audio from text? How do we generate like graphic design layouts and PowerPoints from prompts, right? So that so this kind of like multimedia generation builds on the image generation part. Uh, and then finally, the last thing I want to talk about, which I don't have a cool cartoon for, is no, well, not totally related, but my plan is to talk a little about this thing called NERF, Neural Rendering Fields, which is something that I've always also been curious about. Uh, you know, again, be able to take a few images of an environment and then suddenly be able to make a photorealistic like fly through that environment. So we'll talk a little about NERF at the end of the class if I get around to it. And then uh, the final part is class presentations. So that should be good because I'm going to have all of you come up and do my job instead of me. So um, getting back to the syllabus, um, you, know, you can read about what I want you to learn. Basically, long story short, I want you to be able to not only be able to describe and apply algorithms to do these things, but I also want you to have some historical perspective on the field, right? Where did all this stuff come from and how did it develop? And also to talk about ethical issues involving all this stuff. So throughout the lectures, we'll have little you know, moments where you stop and think about, okay, so is this a good idea? Like, what is the social and economic and ethical cost of doing this stuff, right? Uh, so we will talk about ethical issues in the middle of this. Uh, at the graduate level, here's one of the things that distinguishes the uh, graduate level from the undergraduate course is that if you look at the grading criteria, right, one of the, uh, you know, the main difference between 4964 and 6964 is that for every assignment that I give the whole class, for the graduate students, I'm going to ask you to give me two what I call reaction reports. So I want you to go into the recent academic literature and find two papers on topics that I will tell you what the topic should be, right? Uh, and write me kind of a critical response, right? So that's kind of like part summary, like what was done in this paper? Why was it important? Why was it advanced for the field? And also partially your reaction to it, right? Was it a clearly explained paper? Did you understand something from it? Are there things you're still confused about? You know, like, it's not just like a, a raw paper summary, but a, you know, critical reaction as a maturing researcher, right? And again, I'll talk about that more in a few lectures, right? But that's the idea. So normally the grading is going to basically be five homeworks, more or less, um, and then a course project. And so the course project is going to be something where we do it uh, throughout the class. So I'm going to actually ask you for a proposal for the project very early on. Like as part of homework one, I want you to propose 
kind of a big picture project that you're going to accomplish by the end of the semester that leverages, you know, you don't know how to do any of this stuff yet, but at least you understand like what is, you know, how do, what is generative imaging? What is generative video? What are, what does GPT do, right? So you should be able to kind of like envision a fun project that even if you don't know how to get there yet, you're going to be able to do, right? So uh, the grading is basically going to be for the undergrads, you know, 50% homework assignments, 30% project and 20% participation. And participation is not only coming to class and being engaged in class, but also after every assignment, I'm going to have this kind of what I call peer review uh, system where you'll be able to comment on, again, in a mature and respectful way, other people's work. So every everyone's gonna basically be on every assignment looking at a few other people's assignments to get a sense of like, what'd you like? What didn't you like? You know, give some sort of constructive feedback to the people who did the work. And I think that's also a good way as a leveling, leveling mechanism to see well, what else are people doing in this class, right? Otherwise, normally when you submit a homework, you have no idea what other people are doing, right? I want to be able to have some sense of, you know, again, group cohesion of like, oh, I really like what group two did on this last assignment. And maybe we could do that again for our project or something like that, right? So there's going to be some peer grading that happens after every assignment, and that's part of the participation grade. Um, what else? I mean, there are some details here about how all the weights happen, but that's not a big deal. One thing I will say is that this uh, homeworks and the uh, and the project are going to be team based. Okay, so you need to form a team of between two and three people to do these projects. Right? Partially, it's because I think that you know for for creativity to happen, you need to have more than one brain in the room, right? So I want people who are going to be you know like getting your heads together, thinking about what would be a cool thing to do. Like we could do this, so we could do that. So. Teams of two or three, you can mix the teams at the graduate and undergraduate level, that's okay. Um, so some of you may be undergrads, some of you may be co-terms, some of you may be PhD students. It's okay to mix the levels of people on the team. When it comes to assigning the homeworks, the team as a whole will, will, will submit their assignment on Gradescope. And if you're a graduate student, you will submit your individual reaction reports on the side in a separate assignment on Gradescope, right? So it's okay to kind of break those things apart. Um, so all these things are already on the box, right? So homework zero is really nothing more than uh, by the end of next week, Thursday, uh, you know, form up a team. Tell me, I need to have a good, fun team name, right? So I want to know what the team names are, and I want to know who's in what, uh, you know, team, and I also want to know kind of a little bit about you, like, you know, what is your background? What are your interests in this class? You know, I'm especially interested in people who are, you know, creative, right? So if you are not just a graduate student or an undergraduate student, but you are interested in, you know, making digital art in some sense, right? Let me know that, right? I want creative people in this class. That would be great. There may be some people from GSAS here, for example. That would be awesome. Um, and the other thing is to join the Discord. So that's the, that's your main assignment before the end of next week is to make that work. And I want to make sure that, you know, I don't want to have the team stuff do like at the end of this week because I know people are still maybe shopping for the course. Maybe this course lecture was so exciting that you want to go and grab your friends and have them take this course with you, right? So we have until the end of next week to nail down the teams. And again, if you don't know anybody in the class, then Discord is a good place to try to find team members and hook up, okay? Um, okay, so what else do I want to say about the nuts and bolts of this? Uh, attendance, please come to class. Uh, academic integrity, please don't cheat in class. Uh, and all the support services and so on. Um, you can read the details about this in, in here. Um, like I said, there is no... Uh, TA for the class, right? Which means that, uh, you know, I'm going to be doing my best to, to help you and to grade these things on my own. Uh, so I do have my research assistant, Meng. So Meng is actually a graduated PhD student coming back to me as kind of a research associate. So Meng will be lurking on the Discord. And if you have questions related to, especially the mechanics of how do you get certain packages and so on to work, Meng is a great resource. Again, she doesn't technically work for us, so you can't, you know, like ask her too much. But, you know, that's a good person to ping on the Discord for what's going on. I'm that a lot of you are also much, much, much more knowledgeable about deep learning and packages and so on than I am, right? So please chime in with your expertise when you see people struggling on the Discord, right? Uh, I want, you know, there's, there's not going to be any, like, extra points you get from you being the one who knows how to use this package and no one else knows how to use it, right? That's not what I'm trying to go for in the class, right? So I would like you to kind of share your knowledge around. And in fact, let's take a look at the first homework. Um, so the first homework is... Um, already out and so I, I guess I have a an easy PowerPoint version of this um, so we talked about this guy here's the book oh before I forget um, 
So we're also gonna have some great guest speakers, right? So I'm very interested in the intersection of this technology with you know, non-technology fields, right? So we're gonna have a guest speaker, Aaron Hertzman, who is like a pioneer of basically computer generated, computer mediated art, talking to us about, you know, basically can computers be considered artists, right? What are the kind of like historical and, you know, uh, ethical ramifications of that question, right? Uh, Aaron is expert on that. And then we're also gonna have Dr. Pamela Samuelson from um, uh, Berkeley, and she is a law professor who is expert on the legal challenges to generative AI. I saw her talk uh, online and it was super, super interesting, right? So certainly lots of artists and writers are filing lawsuits against OpenAI and all these companies that saying they're trained, their data was slurped up and being used to generate these uh, algorithms. Do these people have a legal case, right? What does that mean, copyright exactly? So I think that that will be a super interesting lecture to actually learn about legally, you know, where are we in this kind of wild west of people just like slurping up data and using it to train their algorithms. So both those I think should be super interesting. Um, this was the website. Okay, so this is homework zero, homework one, right? So homework one um, I think is hopefully not gonna be super hard, right? So what I want is, uh, the thing that's gonna make the most grumbling is to make your own data set, right? So this is the part where like, there's gonna be some grumbling and some eye rolling, right? But you know, for the first couple of assignments, VAEs, GANs, diffusion models, I don't want you to just be like, grabbing uh, you know, random data sets off the web and training on them, right? That's why all these lawsuits are happening in the first place is that people are being uncritical about curating a data set to create. They're just like grabbing whatever they can download and stuffing it into a model and getting the result, right? That to me is not very uh, you know, mature or ethical researching, right? So instead what I want you to do is with your teammates, come up with some idea for, okay, what is a class of objects that we want to create a model of? Right? And then we'll see how well you can do at recreating that class of objects. Right? So for example, one thing that I saw the other day that I thought was pretty clever was someone has gone out and taken pictures of all the condiment packets that they've ever encountered. Right? So these are all like ketchup packets. Right? So you, know, you can imagine that this is like an interesting idea for a generative model, right? is could you generate now things that look like ketchup packets? Right? So I'm not looking for the same old boring computer vision data sets. Right? I don't want to see the faces, the celeb faces data set. I don't want to see, you know, ImageNet class. I don't want to see, you know, just something that you that you downloaded that someone has already made, right? I want you to make the data set. That's the part that's gonna be somewhat time consuming and somewhat challenging. However, one thing that I will say is that there was, there's another class. So this is a, a artist and researcher called Eric Salvaggio. So he has an excellent uh, lecture series from a similar computational creativity class in his um, uh, practice. And so let me just go back to my browser for a second. So I linked this from the homework on YouTube. Uh, I don't think that I've got necessarily the um, audio working. I might or I might, might not. 500 photographs um, of more or I don't think less. I have the audio working. So basically he describes, for example, so you know, he took you pictures of these pussy willow branches, for example. There's a white background and from a bunch of different camera angles no, and thought about, okay, so. More. Uh, or he took pictures of like stuff on the, the beach, right? Barnacles and so on that he found the uh, pieces of driftwood, right? Lots of different pictures of this stuff. My dog running these kinds of repetitive textures or things like that, an these an are good eye. kinds of Just things to try, right? To so, how and and you got to think about it right now, this is the thing that, that I want you to think about with your group or, is, you know, just kind of like, what would be a fun thing to, to do? Now, to make a good data set, you need to acquire a lot of images, right? So, you know, what, what uh, this professor suggested was to take 500 images, right? Seems like a lot, but the thing that you should remember is that you're not taking images like a photographer that you're gonna put on your Instagram page. You're taking very functional, like, just like, workmanlike images that are meant to train an algorithm, right? Which means you don't have to worry too much about like, is this a beautiful picture, right? You just have to take a bunch of pictures, like imagine just dumping a bunch of Legos out on the table and just like taking a bunch of pictures of individual Lego bricks, right? It's not gonna take you forever to do that. And then of course, once you've taken a bunch of individual images, you will be able to then apply all these typical computer vision tricks of like flipping the image and turning it upside down and making it a little bit bigger, making it a little smaller, you know, like there are ways to augment the data so that by the time you're done with the augmentation, it should be probably more like 3,000 images, right? And that should be enough for your algorithm to really sink its teeth into. So um, that's number one on the homework is basically selecting a good data set and starting to, or not selecting, finding, a, collecting a data set and being intentional about what that data set contains. So um, that's number one. Number two is then to train a, what's called variational autoencoder on this data, right? 
Now, I'm not asking you to write the vari variational autoencoder because this is not really a deep learning class. There's tons of ways to either find a notebook, a Jupyter notebook that does this already, find a collab notebook. Actually, one thing that's, that's really nice about the course, or uh, about the textbook, if I go back to my browser for a second, is that the browser, or the um, textbook has, um, let's go back to my, so the textbook has a very nice GitHub already, and I will be showing you a bunch of examples from this GitHub, but you know there are already a whole bunch of, of nice Jupyter notebooks inside here, and there is one on basically you know VAEs. I'll show you this when we talk about it in a few weeks. But certainly, you know, it's very possible just to like you know take the Jupyter notebook that the book provides and try using that, right? Um, and actually, just as a side note, I will be like basically you know remote desktoping into a machine in my lab to show you examples of of how this stuff works. I think a, a, a big question mark for me, to be honest, is how much you as a class is going to be able to accomplish with your computer tools that you have at hand, right? That's the part that I don't know. I will say that, you know, it's not like all these like GAN artists are working on supercomputers, right? There are certainly ways of doing this stuff on a good laptop or on a good desktop, right? So, um, and of course, if you're all working together, there may be ways to kind of parallelize the computations and so on. So definitely, I want people to be talking on Discord about like, I tried to do this thing on my laptop, it didn't work, what can I do, right? So I think that there are gonna be people who can help out with those kinds of problems. Um, but like I said, the book is a great place to start, but there's gonna be some stuff, I think, especially going into later assignments that goes beyond the book. Um, okay, and then the last thing on the homework is basically to propose your project, right? So um, the details of this are in the homework, I'm not gonna go into it in super detail, but basically, you know, take a look at the, um, take a look at the homework assignment. There's definitely a lot of information about like what I mean when it says collect the data set. Um, what, you, what I want you to do with a VAE. You don't understand this yet, but we'll talk about it you know, in a couple of weeks what this VAE actually is. And then the last page of the homework is the project proposal, right? So uh, again, it should, have, it should involve something that both leverages images and text and video. You know, ideally, it should be something that would be like a good like Instagram reel, right? If you're going to be an influencer, you have to know how to do this stuff, right? So I want you to do something that is like a cool show reel of stuff that you've kind of put together from this class. It's not just like the same level as one homework problem, but something that kind of like ties together a bunch of stuff, right? This is what I always enjoyed doing in my visual effects class was having basically what came out at the end was like a fun video that, you know, and maybe the video that you make or the artifact that you make at the end of class is not like wall to wall generative, whatever. It could be like you film some goofy parts, you know, with live action, and then you put some fun generative stuff in there. I want you to have fun with it, right? So that's the goal. Um, so I ask you for like a little bit of, a, you know, storyboard or stick figures, you know, what are you gonna do? What data are you gonna need? You know, what software do you think you're gonna use? And again, I'm not gonna hold you to this, to the letter, right? Obviously on week one of class, I'm sure that your project is gonna change like hugely between now and the end of classes. But my main goal is that you've actually put some thought into it and you have something that you're kind of working towards because I'm gonna ask you for like a progress report in like October sometime. I think especially as you start to collect this data, you will realize that, you know, collecting data, even if it's just video footage, is gonna take some time. So I wanna make sure that you've got, for example, most of the data that you need collected for your project well before, you know, the leaves start to fall, right, here in the Northeast. Um, okay, so, I think that's it. So let, let, let me just say that, like I said, since this course is entirely new to me, you know, I can't guarantee that every lecture will be 80 minutes. I'm, I mean, I'm aiming for, for less than 80 minutes, right? But for example, this one, it clocked in at like an hour, right? So we'll see how these go. I'm trying to pitch them at being, you know, like 80 minute size. Some of them may be shorter, um, but that's all right. You know, this is a small graduate level class. And so I think that that's fine. So let me pause and ask, since I've been talking continuously, any questions or comments about anything about the, grading, about the expectations, about the assignments. So there's currently, what, 8, 12, 16, 21. So there are more people here than are registered. Or actually, there's the same number here that are registered. So maybe everyone in this register is already here. But um, you know, I would encourage you, it's still early in the semester, to shop around. So if, if you've heard this lecture, and you're like, oh, I should get so-and-so to come and be on my team, that's fine, right? Nothing major is going to be missed until Monday. Let me just say, I, I shouldn't say it, because the next, the next lecture is going to be actually not really that technical at all, because what I want to talk about next time is, um, you know, before, uh, you know, generative AI came about, 
artists were using computers and technology to make art, right? So what were they doing, right? How were they doing it? So I want to talk a little bit about like how artists were using computation in a very broad sense to make art starting from like the 60s and 70s up until like the kind of early 2000s, probably stopping at a point around 2010, right? Just before all of the generative stuff, right? Before GANs and so on, right? We're gonna have a whole, we'll have a whole separate lecture on artists that are using GANs, for example, right? But so next, next time is gonna be basically like survey of art history with a technical flavor. And I'll dig into a couple of algorithms that were particularly notable uh, in the computer graphics field for kind of making these images that look like they've been painterly rendered. This kind of non-photorealistic non rendering was a huge thing kind of in the late 90s, early 2000s. And those algorithms should be easy for anyone here to understand. Um, but lecture two is not like right in line with, with the rest of the course. It's just kind of like, just I wanna give some historical context to like how do people make computer art before GANs, right? So, all right. So any other questions or comments for me? Going once, going twice. All right, that's it. So with that, I will see you on Thursday. Thanks for coming. Tell your friends and uh, see you soon.